One night, while exploring Willem's Wharf, we stumble upon a sewer grate leading to the Hubris Comics utility tunnels. Inside, we find a whole host of ghouls. Feral, Roma, Glowing, and Reaver are all present, as well as a Dean's Electronic skill book and a Stealth Boy. But that's enough about that. At the end of these tunnels, we have the choice to enter through one of two doors. They both lead to the same place, Hubris Comics. The one I chose brought me to the entrance of the building. You'll see shortly where the other one would have taken us. At the reception area, we see in large black lettering, Hubris Comics, and a rather large splash of blood. There's also a poster advertising the adventures of Captain Cosmos, co-starring Jangles the Moon Monkey. This is just one of the many comics that Hubris used to publish. On the receptionist's desk, we find a terminal. Hubris Comics Publishing publishing quality prints at quality prices. Below the greeting, we see a short list of items. At the top, we can select the air conditioning controls, but the system appears to be inoperative. Next, we have the release schedule. Here we can read through the various comics and the month of their release date. Hubris Comics Summer 2077 Schedule. A glorious summer for Hubris and America. June, Captain Cosmos, Truth, Justice, and the Space American Way. Kid Wacky Zany Hijinks, Grognak the Barbarian, Revenge of the Mansorian, Tales from the Front, Alaska Unbowed, July, Grognak's Salute to the Troops, Tales from the Front, Liberated Canada, Captain Cosmos Invasion of the Black Planet, Drake Tungsten, Chrono Cowboy, August, Tales from the Front, The Red Terror, Underground Life, Vault Boy Special, Grognak the Barbarian, An Axe for All Ages, Captain Cosmos, The Radioactive Spacemen, From Space. It appears that both Grognak the Barbarian and Captain Cosmos were the two best sellers and were the only ones to receive a release for three consecutive months. Next, we can read through the letters to the editor, Requiem for an Antagonist. Grognak the Barbarian is an excellent comic for many reasons. But one of the most widely respected ones is the depth of its villains. From the cold-blooded manipulations of the Mansorian to the love-hate romance with Femera, the stories of Grognak's enemies are every bit as fascinating as his own tales. But for my money, no tale is more tragic and more fascinating than that of the Ant Agonizer. While never developed as fully as major villains like Skullpocalypse or Mastodonald, the portrait of the orphaned girl raised by ants and instilled with a bitter hatred of humanity has tremendous potential for reader connection and possible redemption. However, in Grognak the Ants of Agony, Mr. Neptura threw away all of that potential by simply treating the antagonizer as a two-dimensional villain with a futile and pointless grudge against mankind. His writing replaced her subtle undertones of lost humanity and tragically lost innocence with the worst sort of mustache twirling cliche dialogue. It was an offense to a deep and tragic character. How a hack like that continues to find work in comics is beyond my comprehension. Hubris Comics should fire him and return the series to the capable hands of Mr. Morales. Until that time, I refuse to buy another comic from what used to be my favorite publisher. That is one angry customer. We can actually come across the antagonizer in Canterbury Commons. The life of that character couldn't have been the inspiration for the story, considering the 200 year difference in time, but it is strange to think that the reason for the woman becoming the antagonizer is the same origin story as the woman from the comic. I guess life really does imitate art, or in this case, a comic book. Below the fan mail, we can browse the beta testing notice. Miss Grania. Beginning Monday, members of the Grocknack's Little Heathen fan club will begin visiting the offices to participate in beta testing our Reign of Grelok software. Participants must fill out our participation agreement and should be directed to the testing station 15 minutes prior to their scheduled appointment time. Just follow the main hallway all the way to the end and go through the door on your right. From there, the beta testing area is just down the smaller hallway to your right. Rebecca, a personal note, some members of the fan club may be a little exuberant. We realize that you are not a babysitter and appreciate the extra trouble you'll be going through this week. 
This beta test is very important to getting our Hubris software venture off to a good start, so please do your best to keep things under control out front. You will be compensated at time and a half for the week as a token of gratitude for your trouble. Wow, a company that actually pays extra for a difficult shift. And time and a half too, Miss Grania, you lucky thing. Lastly, we can read the press release for immediate release. Hubris Comics and vault Tech Incorporated unveil Vault Boy Meets Hell's Chain Gang, limited five-part miniseries. The very best in Invincible Entertainment and Impenetrable Vaults team up to bring comic fans a gripping grimoire of greatness. From their headquarters in Washington, D.C., Hubris Comics announced today plans to bring a beloved American icon into the Hubris Comics universe, none other than the beloved Vault Boy character. Vault Boy was the perfect choice for our new Hal's Chain Gang series, says Hubris Comics Chief of Publishing Peter Shiner, in which those valiant vigilantes take on Chairman Cheng's commie cyborg corpse. After all, Vault Boy knows a thing or two about going up against the Red Menace. The five-part miniseries will feature an alternate future in which Chinese communists have invaded America. Vault Boy and Hell's Chain Gang are the last best hope for America to break free from the shackles of communism in this cautionary tale of vigilance. It has always been vault Tech's mission to educate and protect our countrymen from the communist threat, commented vault Tech Public Relations Executive Joanne Strausser. This exciting project is a perfect opportunity to thrill young Americans while sending home an important message for us all. Every good American must help shoulder the burden of freedom and always be wary of the communist threat. The first issue of this miniseries will be available on newsstands everywhere this holiday season. About Hubris Comics. Hubris Comics, a branch of Hubris Publishing, headquartered in Washington, D.C., has been producing printed entertainment since 2021. Hubris Comics are known for such popular properties as Grocknack the Barbarian, Hell's Chain Gang, and The Inspector. A lot of great titles and plans to involve vault Tech's mascot, all snuffed out by the Great War. China taking over America is definitely something I would like to see, perhaps as a simulation in a later Fallout title. Probably not, but I can hope. Backing out of the terminal and turning around, we find a Tales of a Junktown jerky vendor on a shelf, and a rigged terminal that we can disarm. From here, we can head into the restroom and disarm a toilet trap. I wonder if anyone has ever fell for this. It's a rare thing to be desperate enough to drink from a toilet to heal, and the wires are quite obvious, so I can't imagine there being that many people. Leave a comment down below if you happen to be one of the unfortunate few. Exiting the restroom and turning left, we can collect a pre-war book from the shelf and climb over the small pile of desks and refuse. Opening the double doors leads to a long hallway filled with traps. The left turning has been completely blocked, but we can disarm a tripwire connected to a shotgun and a baby carriage rigged to explode. At the end of the hallway, we can go through a door on the right and take a left to get to a T-junction. Looking left, we see a group of feral ghouls. After killing two, I decided to plant a bottle cap mine to cover that side while I went to explore the beta testing area. Before heading in, we can loot a vending machine and an Eatertronic for some tasty pre-war snacks. As we turn around, we see a feral ghoul slowly approaching. Inside the beta testing room, we see a large hole in the floor and a number of desks scattered around the outer wall. After looting the desks for some bottle caps, we see a hanging bouquet of grenades and a tripwire at the bottom of the stairs. It turns out these two are not connected, and I've just disarmed two opposing sides of two separate traps. But turning around and looking back up the stairs, we see the second grenade bunch and disarm that too. The other tripwire poses no threat now, the explosives have been removed. Down here we find a working terminal, titled The Reign of Greloc. Logging on, we see a list of command prompts and can actually play the game that the Little Heathens fan club was supposed to beta test. Now this is cool. Look around planes. 
You are standing in a wide plain. Foothills stretch to the north, where clouds gather around an ominous peak. A dirt path winds from a lonely chapel to the east through the plains where you're standing, and south into a bustling town. Wispy mists gather over marshland in the west, where a thin tower stands alone in the bog. Go north. Look around mountainside. You are on the craggy, wind-blasted face of a mountain. Storm clouds coil above the summit, pelting you and the sparse vegetation with torrential downpour. Far below, beyond the foothills, a wide plain stretches across the southern horizon. Grelok is here, spewing heresies. A glint between the rocks catches your eye. Investigate glinting object. You take a rough gemstone from the rocks. Let's check our inventory. Rusty sword, your weapon. Rusty, but trusty. Drinking flask, a very small flask to carry water. Raw gemstone, this gemstone may be valuable. Use sword on Grelok. Your puny weapons are useless on Grelok. It looks like we're going to need something a little more powerful. Let's head back and take another direction. This time we head south. Look around town. You're standing in the dusty market square of a quiet town. Many of the shops and homes lie abandoned, and the citizens that can be seen speak in hushed voices, casting furtive glances at the darkened skyline in the distant north. The ringing of an anvil breaks the silence regularly, where a mustachioed blacksmith bends over his work in a nearby tent. The blacksmith is here, working. A priest is here, drinking. Speak with blacksmith. Your eyes water from the smoke and smarmy heat inside the tent. The huge man swipes sweat from his bald head and looks up from his work. There's no shortage of work to be done, with Grelok scaring everyone witless. Leave me to filling my orders, stranger. With that, the blacksmith dismisses you from his tent and douses a hot blade in water, hissing with steam. Speak with priest. The priest notices your approach and looks up from his swilling. Grelok is come and we are forsaken, he cries. Erp. He continues, as you recover from the stench of his priestly belch, you are told that the priest has fled from his nearby chapel. When Grelok arrived on the mountain, the dead in his cemetery began to rise, and his congregation scattered. If you could rid the place of the zombies, he tells you, I'll give you the key, and you can help yourself to the apothecary. With that information, we retreat back to the center and head to the east. Chapel. Look around. You stand at the end of a dirt path, facing a small chapel. The stucco walls are faded, many roof tiles are missing. The great oaken doors are locked, the congregation is nowhere to be found. A small cemetery of crooked headstones lies in the shadow of the cracked steeple. The dirt path winds westward through a great featureless plain. A zombie totters aimlessly nearby. There is an open grave nearby. Use sword on zombie. Your blow knocks the zombie into a grave. Examine grave. There is a deep, empty grave in the cemetery. Several bloated rats and a zombie corpse float in a foot of filthy water at the bottom. Don't fall in. A grotesque zombie head is stuck on a root near the top of the grave. You bag the horrific trophy as proof of your deed. Let's take a look at that zombie head. The smell, may <laughs> the smell may make you unpopular, I can imagine. Let's return and speak with the priest. The priest drunkenly curses the undead who have defiled his church. You present him with the decapitated zombie head from your bag. Praise you, he hiccups. Perhaps Grelok's influence isn't so strong. With that, he turns his decanter over and tosses it into the fireplace, where it bursts into a purple flame and burns up almost instantly. I must gather the faithful. He presses a brass key into your palm. Please, help yourself to what little may be of use at my chapel. Returning to the chapel, we see a new line of text. The chapel doors are unlocked. Examine chapel. Dust motes hang lazily in the shafts of colored light, stretching across the chapel from peaked windows. The pews, pulpit, and everything else are covered in a fine mist. There is a very deep stone cistern near the entrance. It is full to the brim with blessed water. There is more than enough water here to fill your tiny flask. Checking our inventory, we see that the tiny flask 
is now full of blessed water, and we can also see the key that was given to us by the drunken priest. With a full flask, we backtrack and head to the final direction, west. Swamp, look around. You are standing on a narrow stone path in a dark marsh. Greasy bubbles float to the top of the bog waters on either side and pop lazily, spattering your legs with muck and slime. A short stone tower squats here. No door is visible, and the stones are smooth and polished. A balcony juts out midway up the tower's face. The heavy smells of incense mix with the nauseating stench of the swamp. The stone path unfurls eastward, towards a broad plain beyond the marshes. A wizard is here, gesticulating wildly from his balcony. Talk to the wizard. Hoo-hoo, the slayer of Grelok approaches. Raw stone in hand, just as I've seen. The wizard's pointy hat bobs excitedly as he points a finger at you. Suddenly, a pale orange arc of light extends from the knobbly finger and draws the gemstone from your bag before you can react. The gemstone halts and hovers in the air before the wizard's nose. Essence be true, powers renew, fatty who do. With that, he slaps the hovering stone, smashing it against the smooth stone of the tower. In a burst of light, the stone splits into two, and one lands in each outstretched palm of the hopping little wizard. Shard for the sword, wrapper in iron, and she'll find Grelok's black heart for you. Take the chaff, too. You'll need payment for a smith to forge the weapon. He tosses the stones down, which you leap forward to catch safely. Our inventory is now changed, and we can see a refined gemstone, a brilliant faceted gemstone, and a magical shard. The gemstone pulses with magical light. Heading back to the town, we can now interact with the blacksmith, who has a new piece of dialogue. The blacksmith regards you gruffly and is about to dismiss you when you produce the polished gemstone from your bag. He sets his hammer aside and twirls his moustache. A right fine stone, that is, he says, admiring the faceted stone. What would you be needing, then? Following your careful instructions, the smithy reforges your rusty sword with the magical shard at the center of the blade. We now have a magical sword, an enchanted weapon to defeat Grelok. Before heading to the northern mountain to defeat Grelok, we can quickly check in with the priest and see how he's getting on. The priest is drinking water, pouring over a thick leather-bound volume connected by a thick leather thong to his neck. He notices you only when you've come very close. Ah, good friend. Have you gone ahead to open the chapel? My body still aches with drink, I'm afraid. But soon I will gather the congregation and return myself. Well, that's the priest taken care of. The blacksmith has fulfilled his task, and the wizard has also played his part. I did return to the wizard with the magical sword, but he didn't have anything new to say. Heading north, we can now use the magical sword against Grelok. When you draw your sword, Grelok lowers his great horned head and bellows laughter in your face. You grit your teeth and swing a mighty two-handed blow, the magical blade ringing clearly, even amid the tumult of throaty crackling. You swing the sword so fiercely it escapes your grip and hurtles into the open maw of the monstrosity lost from sight and in the arid darkness of Grelok's throat. You step back as Grelok jerks his mouth shut and stands upright. He is still for a moment, then starts clawing at his neck, muffled. A ringing can be heard as if from a great distance. Suddenly, Grelok's chest bursts in a fountain of viscous green blood. The ringing can be heard clearly now, and as thick lifeblood oozes around the protruding tip of the magic sword, the storm clouds swirling the peak are already clearing. Grelok is defeated. The end. Thanks for playing. That was actually a lot of fun. There is no option to replay and try new things, only a victory text which leads to a game over screen. The Fallout wiki states that you can get an additional piece of dialogue from the wizard if you go to him first before picking up the raw gemstone. Anyway, back to Hubris Comics. At the southwest corner, we can disarm a tripwire and collect some first aid. But before we finish, a feral ghoul starts running towards us. But not just any ghoul, a feral ghoul reaver.
With the beta testing room done, we can leave Grelot behind and head to the other end of the corridor. Here we see row after row of desks and typewriters, presumably the typist room dedicated to writing new stories. One half of the room has collapsed, exposing the lower floor. As we're searching the numerous desks, we hear the gargled vocals of a ghoul. The desks are mostly filled with caps and ammunition. Hugging the left wall, we can make it across the broken floor and turn left. This leads to the second utility tunnel exit I mentioned earlier. Backtracking up the stairs, we can make our way down to the lower floor of the typist room. Here we see a janitor's closet, but there's nothing worth picking up. As for the other room, there's multiple damaged books and not much else. I was hoping to find a whole collection of comics published by Hubris, but no such thing came my way. To the south are the restrooms, inside the gents is another toilet trap, and nothing in the ladies. The only path left to take is behind the row of typewriters, down a dark hallway, where we see a trio of baseball pitching machines. The tripwire is found close by, and we can travel down the hallway without getting pelted. The next room is on the other side of the barricade we saw just before the carriage bomb. The loot here is naff, but we do find an elevator that will take us to Hubris Comics Printing. As we enter, we hear gunshots. To the right are two turrets, firing upon a group of ghouls. From here we see a glowing ghoul and a mixture of others. How did that turret see me? Uh oh, another reaver. Those turrets did more good than harm, but I'm still going to have to take them out. As the last turret explodes, we see a man wielding a minigun. Vats reveals his name to be Mad Johnny Wes. He's also hostile, and if it's red, it's better dead. We'll get to his body later, for now let's work on getting this place cleared. The right side of the walkway has several live mines that we can disarm. I guess we now know who's responsible for all of the traps. At the center is Hubris Comics Publishing Printing Press Terminal. Remember to make sure no one is near the press while operating. Sounds like Hubris might have had a little accident and feels the need to remind people of how they can simply avoid any further mishaps. We can turn on the printing press, which brings up a warning. Machine malfunctioning. We're off to a good start. Check manuscript. Grognak the Barbarian, number 361. If we're lucky, maybe we'll get a copy. Check ink levels. Only the red ink appears to be low. And check paper stock. Low grade pulp available. Not really any issues, so what's preventing the machine from working? As we exit the terminal, the machines below begin to smoke. At the time, I didn't really notice. Heading downstairs to the machine, we take a brief detour under the stairs and find a skeleton. In arm's reach is a scoped 44 Magnum, first aid, and a nice supply of Magnum ammo. Over at the printing press, we see what's causing the machine to falter. I tried turning the machine off and pulling the skeleton out, but it couldn't be interacted with. I guess we won't be getting that comic after all. In one corner of the room is a glass box that cannot be entered from out here. There's a nearby doorway we can take which does lead left, but to the right two ghouls run headfirst into a trap. One of them seemed to make it through. Let's save the box and track down that ghoul. The pitching machines are spent, so no trouble there. At the end of the hallway are stairs where the ghoul was casually waiting. Behind this locked door is the foreman's office and the body of Mad Johnny Wes. On the desk is a Grognak the Barbarian comic book. It's unknown if this is the very same the machine promised to print, but for my sake, I'm gonna pretend it is. The terminal is used to control the turrets, but they no longer exist. 
Beside that are two dart packets and a new Coca-Cola Quantum. On the floor we find a nice supply of 5mm ammunition and on the wall an equally pleasing supply of first aid. Johnny had quite the setup. Speaking of which, inside Johnny's pockets we find 60 more 5mm rounds, a baseball bat, two darts, the minigun he was previously using before his head popped off, two cans of pork and beans, three psychos, enough scotch to kill a deathclaw, two stimpaks, a teddy bear, toy car, and the clothes on his back. <sighs> As for who this man was and what he was doing here, the official game guide states, Johnny West was hemmed in by a super mutant camp and almost savaged to death by a relentless ghoul onslaught. His mind snapped, reverting to its most basic instinct. He's holed up in the most defensible location of Hubris Comics, a foreman's office he's dubbed the Alamo, and rigged the entire building with traps. They'll never take him alive. Never. You got that right. With the temporary foreman decapitated, we can head to the final room dubbed the Glass Box. Inside we find some junk, a terminal with the same pieces of text as the receptionist's computer, However, there is an option to unlock the foreman's door. Very useful if your lockpick skill isn't high enough. Lastly, there's first aid on the shelf and a pre-war book. And there we have it. Hubris Comics, The Reign of Grelock, and Mad Johnny Wes. If you enjoyed today's video, then consider leaving a comment, liking the video, sharing it with a friend, subscribing to see more, and enabling notifications to avoid missing any activity. Thank you for watching, and I will see you in the next adventure.